Good morning, everybody. I hope that it is a good morning for wherever you might find yourself um, in South Africa and, and elsewhere. A very warm welcome to the Jobs Fund briefing session on um, breaking barriers, future proofing South Africa's employment options. My name is Najwa and I am the head of the Jobs Fund. And let me just start out by saying that I am extremely grateful for all of you who have made the time to listen to us this morning. This morning really is about you've all would have seen, I mean, having registered, you would have seen the term sheet, you would have browsed through our website, um, you would have seen how to apply. Many of you have already started um, registering, um, soon to find notifications from my team, encouraging you to complete your, the, the registration process, et cetera, et cetera. I think that what drives us all is common purpose. Everybody that has registered um, to be a part of this uh, briefing session this morning, I truly believe holds the common purpose and the common intent of improving the employment situation in our country. And so in that, we are united. So I thank you for being here this morning. Um, my team is going to talk a little bit about um, the Jobs Fund. Um, they are going to tell you uh, a little bit about our history, but not, not too much. Um, but just to give you, for those of, our, of you who are not familiar with the Jobs Fund, to give you a sense of who you would be partnering with if you are successful. We're then also going to tell you a, a little bit more about the, the end a grant recipient, you know, who we want our grant to target, the kind of barriers that we would like your assistance on in addressing in the labour market. We're going to expand on the, the priority sectors that we've identified. That doesn't mean to say that we exclude innovation in other sectors, but you know, the research does say that there are particular sectors at the moment that lends itself to, um, to job creation. Then also we're going to share with you our funding windows, um, a little bit more background, what it means um, to give you guidance as to, you know, under which window you would like to register your application. We're going to talk about eligibility criteria as well as impact criteria. And then very importantly, we are going to share with you how we measure within the jobs fund, how we measure the creation of jobs. And that um, is going to be consistent for every single application. So there are, there are primary indicators that we use to measure job creation. And then of course, every project and application is unique and there'll be an opportunity to have secondary applications. But it is those primary uh, um, indi indication indicators that we um, would like to explain because often, and, and, and I tell you this, um, you know, we've had 10 funding rounds already, but when we contract, you know, when people, when it comes to the point where people have to sign, um, they say, um, no, 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 that is not what we meant. So people, please, I implore you, read the term sheet, read our definitions, because that is what we are going to be measuring you on, and that is what we're going to be disbursing the grant against. We're also going to share with you our expect expectations around contracting. Um, you know, a, a, a template contract will be available on our site. It seems to be a lengthy document, but it does explain, you know, where we come from, what it is and how we contract so that when it comes time to do that, it is not a long drawn out um, process. And then lastly, we're also going to share with you how to navigate the application form. Now, when I started out, I said there's quite a few people who have registered. We had uh, more than 800 people register. So um, you can imagine that trying to, to watch for everybody's hand when they have a question is going to be a bit of a challenge. So I apologize, but we have muted 
all participants to this briefing session, with the exception of those people um, who are doing the presentation. But I can assure you, I have a wonderful team that is going to be monitoring the chat and they are going to um, answer your questions there. Um, you, those of you who have gone to our website would also see we have a document called Frequently Asked Questions. It is very useful to also familiarize yourself with that. The presentation that we make here this morning, it is going to be posted on the, on the chat. But for now, I'm going to um, also invite you to just introduce yourself in the chat because later on you might want to link up with people, um, connect, um, you know, uh, submit a joint application. So please do introduce yourself. And um, with that, I'm going to hand you over to, to Xavier Itziwa, who is the Director of Projects at the Jobs Fund. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoy. Xavier? Thank you very much, Najwa. A good morning to everyone on the in this session. Welcome to potential applicants. Uh, we look forward to work the journey with you and eventually for you to become jobs, jobs fund partners once uh, you have been approved. I have just put in my the, the video so that you could see the person who is speaking. I will switch off my video as I present so as to save on bandwidth. We all know the challenges that we are facing. Uh, so I will just switch off my uh, my, my videos. OK, um, colleagues, um, as, as Nigeria has indicated, uh, we are excited to be uh, hosting the, the, the potential applicants here. I just need to raise just two points before we do, before I go into the presentation. As we do present, you will note that the slides um, will be detailed. We will not be going through the slides on a detail as they are. The reason why we made these slides detailed and they are going to be available uh, on uh, um, once we have done the presentation is so that we capture all the relevant details and we can use that as a reference point. Um, one other point also we just need to note to, to for members to note is that as the jobs fund, uh, we do work with organizations. OK, we do not offer individual employment uh, opportunities. Uh, we are raising this because we have seen in some uh, registrations people asking those questions upfront. So we do work with organizations and uh, we do not offer individual uh, employment under this uh, the funding round, so to speak. OK, so now let's just quickly talk about who is the jobs fund. Um, as, uh, as Nigel did indicate, we will be very brief on this, on the understanding that members have gone through our website and so forth. So the Jobs Fund is a program of National Treasury. It, it was established in 2011 and it operates as a challenge fund. The Jobs Fund leverages private funds to co-fund, test and implement innovative job creation models. What are the core features of a challenge fund? We are looking here at openness, transparency, and a competitive process. We are looking here at the issue of pairing, co-sharing of risks and costs. And this is where the element of match funding will come in, as you hear later on. Lastly, one of the key goals when we are losing the challenge fund and also specifically in this funding round is to overcome the barriers to entry into the identified sectors. On the next slide, we will we'll briefly tell you what are the deli jobs fund delivery, delivery model. Today we are all here because we have opened a call for proposal, so we are on step one. We will then proceed to application where the applicants yourselves will submit your application online, will do the appraisal, and then there'll be the approval by the Independent Investment Committee. Once your project has been approved, we go into finalizing of issues such as ABCP, budgets, contracting, and so forth. 
then we do contract finalization and the grant agreement is signed. Then there is implementation of the project, wherein we'll do the quarterly disbursements based on the achieved um, outcomes as agreed in the in the grant agreement. Once the project is finished implementation, we will then go into post implementation monitoring, and then subsequently final close out. So that's in, in summary how the jobs fund operates. Now, let's turn our attention to what we are all here for today, which is to unpack the 11th call for proposal. As you know, the theme for this funding round is breaking barriers, future proofing South Africa's employment opportunities. It is important as we go on to keep note of that uh, theme, breaking barriers. We do want to break the barriers so that we can facilitate employment. It is no secret that, the, the, that we all know that the country is faced with unprecedented levels of unemployment. The world of work is rapidly changing. In terms of global context, it has been shown that there is need to empower workforce with the right skills so that they can adequately respond to new challenges. The World Economic Forum uh, published a report uh, called the Future um, of Jobs Report, and they indicated that nearly 25% of jobs will change globally. Yes, indeed, we all accept that each country, each industry is faced with some structural constraints. But however, there is a way or there is room for all of us here to play in addressing the unemployment challenges, i.e. we must focus on the barriers on both the demand and supply side of the employment equation. Next slide, please. In that context of the theme that we have just indicated, the Jobs Fund is inviting applicants to work with us to break these barriers. The barriers to labor market entry by stimulating new demand in growth sectors and improving the supply of appropriately skilled workforce. As I said again, it is going to be important for us to keep on uh, touching base on what is the theme of this funding round. Now, let's look at the overview. So we've given you the context. What is driving this uh, 11th call for proposal? So now let's look at an overview. What are we targeting? The key element in Jobs Fund is always to look at innovative solutions. So we are thus targeting initiatives that will focus interventions that present innovative solutions to stimulate demand for new jobs. You hear when you talk about enterprise development uh, 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 window. We, we are looking at initiatives, looking at skilling, and or upskilling and then matching work for work seekers to jobs and facilitating new pathways to jobs. Again, you hear when we talk about support for work, support for work seekers funding round. We are also looking at applications that will focus on youth and women. What are the target beneficiaries and the priority sectors? We are targeting sectors and or subsectors that are highly labor absorptive. A research was done which confirmed that in the period 2023 to 27 to 2027, the following sectors will give the highest net job growth. 
that is communication, social service, trade, construction, agriculture, logistics and transport, and the informal sector. The key point to note here is these sectors don't operate in isolation. They are related industries in the value chain. So we need to look at those opportunities that are also in the related industries uh, in the value chain to support uh, uh, those which feed into these growing uh, growing sectors. As Najwa did indicate at the beginning, uh, we are not excluding any other sectors, but we are pointing out these are the sectors that uh, the research has shown that there is that significant growth. So what are the barriers that we're looking to address? I will not cover all of them because we have detailed in there. Some of them we are looking at access to finance, technology, market regulations, and how do we broaden the value chain so that we can facilitate uh, more job creation. Now, what what does a competitive application look like? This is important when you talk uh, when we begin to understand issue of competition. As I did indicate, one of the principles of challenge fund is competition. Those projects that may that will not be successful when you receive letters of decline, you you get a statement, for example, to say your application was not competitive. It is purely on these principles. We will not be in any way saying that your application is a bad application. We are simply saying there were other applications who were offering a solution in the similar sector or a similar intervention, but you were not competitive enough. So what does a competitive application look like? It needs to clearly demonstrate things such as, again, I'm not going to detail all of them. I'll pick a few. It needs to clearly demonstrate the ability to crowd in sector intermediaries. The ability to unlock blockages in the identified sectors. Again, we're talking about the barriers. Is there adequate track record and capacity to implement? Is this project, is there enough demonstration to able to replicate or scale up the project? What is the ability to reach economically marginalized areas such as townships, distressed inner cities, informal sectors, settlements, and rural areas? What is the package being provided to the beneficiaries, such as access to market, business development services? What is the path to sustainability? What is the ability to raise the match funding? Is the project, are you able to, to implement the project in the two years that we are looking at? How effective, how effective is your monitoring and evaluation framework? You will note as we go on when you talk to deliverables, how important that uh, aspect is. Now, let's look at the funding windows. What funding windows are covered under the 11th, uh, 11th call? The 11th call is open for applications uh, within three funding windows. The first one being the enterprise development. This is what we'd say it addresses the demand side of the labor equation. Here we are looking at those interventions that are going to result in growth in enterprises, growth in SMEs, broadening their supply chains. To the extent that the growth in these businesses will thus result in demand for, for labor. Thus, the interventions under the, the enterprise development window should reduce risk, remove the barriers to market access, 
and or improve broaden supply chains. Our next window is the support for work seekers. This is the supply side of the employment equation. We are looking at initiatives that will link work seekers, especially youth and women, to formal and informal sector opportunities and job placements. We are focusing here on demand-led intervention. As we present, you hear later on that we do not look at applications that are training for the sake of training. They need to be a demonstration of demand-led and the uh, employment or placement thereof. The next window is what we call ICB, or Institutional Capacity Building. This window is aimed at supporting intermediaries who need to build capacity to reach more enterprises so as to provide some specific services. An example to, to illustrate that, well, sometimes uh, um, it, it, it is a window that uh, sometimes people uh, misinterpret. So let's look at an example of an organization. An organization, let's say they say they are based in uh, in Limpopo, and they do work with um, with uh, emerging farmers, um, teaching them on the best irrigation uh, methods. However, currently they know that in Limpopo there there are two thousand farmers who need this service, but they only have staff, infrastructure, ETC, uh, to service maybe let's say 10 farmers in, a, in, in, in six months. So they're saying, you know what? So we are unable, so so many farmers are not being reached. Therefore, they keep on using substandard um, um, methods of irrigation. We need to be capacitated so that we can reach, we can, we can increase from reaching 10 farmers to let's say 50 farmers in six months. So they need to, they need capacity, uh, capacitation for them to do more of what they can do so that they can reach these farmers and these farmers can be now be uh, taught of good farming methods. Then they can do well. Then based on that, they'll be able to create jobs and so forth. So that's what we mean by institutional capacity building. We are building capacity of the uh, uh, support intermediaries. So having looked at these windows, I know some of you might have looked at um, uh, said, oh, but we know previously there was a, a funding window uh, called infrastructure. We are saying any project that is infrastructure components ought to fit under ED enterprise development, under support for work seekers or ICB. So yes, you can have a project that is infrastructure uh, elements, but they ought to be linked to those or to fall uh, within uh, any one of those three. Now let's look at eligibility criteria. I always like start to, uh, to liken this, um, giving us an example of a sports. Some of us here yeah, support soccer, some rugby, some cricket. I think we all know the uniform for your team that you support. And when they walk into the uh, on the pitch stadium, you know what they are what they are wearing. If you support soccer, you don't expect to see uh, the team walking there holding bets and wearing helmets. It means they are obviously wearing the wrong uniform. So the first thing is, what are you supposed to? to look like what are you supposed to wear before you start wearing the game before you start playing the game the outcome of playing the game is the impact which we'll look at later on what we're looking at right now is are you eligible to play the game of soccer are you eligible to play the game of cricket so what is our eligibility criteria the first one is the minimum grant size is five million that's what the minimum requests from the jobs fund. 
And when you look at the match funding ratio, as I did indicate, we look at core sharing, risk sharing. The match funding ratio for any organization that are in the private and public uh, uh, public entities, entities is one is to one, meaning that if you request five million from the jobs fund, you must also put five million, one rand for one rand. For the NGO NPOs, the match funding ratio is one is 0 0.5. If you request five million from the jobs fund, you must therefore put uh, at least 50% of that, which is 2.5. So for every one rand from jobs fund, the NPO NGOs must put in at least. You will note there I'm using the word at least. It is important to note that this is competition. So when we say one to one, we're not necessarily saying we need uh, one to one. We are saying you, it must be at least. So if the 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 other applicant who is going to offer more on 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 match funding, they will obviously uh, be more competitive than those just uh, meeting the minimum requirements. On match funding, what are we looking at is demonstration of your ability to secure match funding. We divide this into two categories. The self-funded match funding. And in this case, we're just looking for a written undertaking from the applicant themselves, showing that they will contribute match funding. Uh, however, this must obviously be supported by straw, the applicant's uh, financial statements to show that they have the capacity to, to, to fund this internally or to raise uh, whichever the case might be. If your fund match funding is coming from third parties, we are looking at any of the following as demonstration of the ability, a formal written undertaking from the match funding provider, confirming that the match funding has been secured, or proof that you have submitted application to a funder, um, and also demonstration of the progress that you have made in towards securing the match funding uh, in this case could be again a letter uh, showing us this the time frame the stated to the status of the application what is the time frame to finalization and so forth so these are the requirement that we need as a way of demonstrating your ability to match match funding the next item which is number three on our um match eligibility is Compliance with the governance and administrative requirements such as tax, we detail that in the applicant in the term sheet. The next requirement is that the applicant, the lead applicant, must be solvent. And they must have been operating for more than two years. And they must have complete audited or reviewed annual financial statements for the previous two years. Also for the lead applicant, they will be required to provide management accounts for the period of from their last audit or review date to 31 May 2023. We do take note that listed entities may have some uh, limitations. Uh, or, or restrictions in terms of when to share uh, management accounts ETC. So in that case, limited uh, listed entities may provide interim statements uh, where management accounts are not available. What is the requirement? This is the next requirement in terms of uh, the project implementer. We are looking at at least three years of technical experience in the area that you are applying for. So if one is applying for to support in irrigation and so forth, if you had that technical expertise uh, for uh, in that field of in that field of uh, area, of, area of interest for the last three years, then we also have the requirement to demonstrate that the application, the applicant, you will be able to deliver the outcomes within the 24 month set. The next requirement is that we do take note that as the project is implemented, there is always intellectual um, property that comes in the IP. So we would require the applicants to acknowledge that while the intellectual property 
um, resides with the applicant, they shall permit the jobs fund to use the concept for learning and dissemination purposes. Please note that this would be not be used for any commercial purposes. The last eligibility covers those applicants that are currently jobs fund partners or previously jobs fund partners, those that have been funded by the jobs fund. We will require you to demonstrate the following as at the end of March uh, this year. Should they have met at least 50% of the contracted implementation period, um, more than 50% uh, performance on jobs plus placement combined, and at least 50% of the in, in inception to date expenditure. Now, so if there is eligibility, then there ought to be some exclusions. What are those exclusions? So, examples of ineligible applications covers those that are seeking to exclusively fund research and development, bailing out of distressed applicants, training that is not demand-led and that does not result in placement, as I indicated before, not able to deliver the outcomes in two years. On lending applicants, do you have a finance-ready pipeline? If not, then that's ineligible. Is the application to fund activities that the same activities that are already being funded by other funders, double dipping? Yes, we do know that one might come to us and say, I'm receiving funding from this organization in this particular, and this is my model, and I need find, uh, funding for this. We uh, uh, check, is there no potential for double dipping? And here we look, we look at, are we funding se same activities? If we are, then that's double dipping. But if we are coming and say, we are funding different activities, complementary activities from what has been funded by this organization for us to complete this project, that is, the, that is okay, but not for the same activities. We cannot be funding for the same activities funded by other partners. And lastly, we look at your project. Is this overly dependent on grant funding? If not, if, so if that is the case, then that application will not be eligible. Ladies and gentlemen, this takes us to the end of this section where I ended up talking about who is eligible to play this game. Now I hand you over to Lionel, who is going to tell us how do you dribble? How do you dazzle the opponents? What is the impact criteria? Lionel, over to you. Thanks, Xavier, and a very good morning to everybody. I hope you are still enjoying the morning at the Jobs Fund. I will be taking you through the impact criteria. So now after you've qualified to play the game, as Xavier has put it, and you've now aced the eligibility by supplying all the information required, your application will start competing in the following areas, which will be the social impact, uh, additionality, uh, sustainability, value for money and risk apportionment, which is mainly driven by uh, the amount of match funding, uh, innovation, um scaling scaling up or re, uh, replication of the project uh, contribution to systemic change and your capacity to to implement the project next slide on when we look at social impact what we look well, what is it that we look for uh, here, the the initiative should lean towards economic economically marginalized areas. So it could be rural areas, peri-urban uh, townships, etc., or even 
poor provinces, if as others would refer to some provinces as uh, creating jobs in the informal sector. And also that social impact measures need to be recognized as me and measured as per our indicator protocols. Uh, my colleague who's going to come after me will take you through those uh, indicator protocols. And uh, additionality. Here you need to demonstrate that the intervention would not have taken place without our participation. So we do not want to replace a, a bank. We will we will also need to or you will also need to give us the evidence that this is the situation that the intervention wouldn't have taken place without us. Uh, remember, we are not here to distort or replace a, a current or ongoing market activities. If you look at the NPOs, we will consider funding the project administration costs and other expenditures uh, to increase their capacity. But however, we kept it at 20%. Uh, for the total requirement, uh, for the total funding requirement for ED and support for exercise, and then it's 30% for institutional capacity building window. You, this is also covered on the term sheet, and I would really, I would encourage you to go through the term sheet and also through the presentation at your own pace. Now, remember additionality is not requesting funds to finance your current activities. So we are not here to, to compete with FNB or DFIs. Under sustainability, the application should be able to demonstrate a path to commercial sustainability, uh, even beyond our the term that you'll be implementing the project with us. This should illustrate the sustainability of the job created and then as well as the, the project itself. So both the jobs that have been created and the project should be sustainable. When we go to the next one, which is uh, value for money and risk apportionment. Uh, with more emphasis on match funding, we we define this as really risk sharing. This is where we are. We seek to leverage existing resources which are available in the economy for the betterment of the society by creating jobs. Now, uh, Xavier has touched on the match funding ratios, which he has mentioned that the minimum is one is to one for private and public uh, entities, and one is to 0.5 for NPOs. Now, the thing that I want to underline there is that, well, the in-kind match funding, we do consider it, but not in the calculation of the match funding. It will add, uh, but it will make you more competitive. Now, remember as well uh, that when we say one is to one, that is the bare minimum ratio that we would we would accept. So if you say for a rent that Jobs fund puts in, you put in five rents, then we you are proving that you believe in in the in the in the intervention um, that you are seeking. Under uh, innovation, here we we wanted to demonstrate that your intervention uh, it has the elements which which are new and it, it's also innovative. So it means you can't be extending a, a project that you are currently implementing just because the funds are running out. No, we wouldn't consider that as innovation. So on innovation, you, you will not score or you will score very low. Under scale, scale up or replication, you, you, you must show that um, you'll be able to leverage 
the partners or resources to multiply the, the outcomes. Outcomes can be the jobs or the number of SMMEs that you will create, which will eventually lead to jobs, or whatever other outcomes that you would have, we would have agreed um, on. You also need to, to show how costs will be kept low whilst you are increasing the output. Now you also, under replication, you need to demonstrate how that, that job creation model can be replicable. If we then go to the next slide, under contribution to systemic change. Now we want to see how your application will contribute to broader impact in the sector or in the industry. It can be the value chain or in the economically marginalized areas that we spoke about, as well as learning beyond the confines of the specific initiatives. So you should show how you're going to influence the ecosystem around your the, the in the environment that your your project will will take place. If we go to the uh, capacity to implement, you have to show that you've got relevant experience and also the organization itself has the experience in the, in, in the area where the project is, uh, is participating. So you can be a baker or a baker and then uh, Putting a project to to train pharmacists, or which will uh, which seeks to increase the number of pharmacy, pharmacists in the country. You must also show that there is a potential pipeline of beneficiaries that will be participating in the project. Uh, that is critical because if you have, if you would have read the term sheet, you would have seen that it's the the duration of the implementation would be two years of the project. So on day one, you should be ready to run. You you can't say on day one you are you are still going to spot shop to buy the soccer boots to to follow on Xavier's um, uh, example. Now, if if there is a consortium, then you you need to elaborate on the on how that consortium is composed, and there must be logic and value adding. In so you you can uh, what other people might do we we are aware of that so let me let me just warn you up front uh, just to just to play around with the match funding ratios then you you go and you get the NPO who is not going to add value just to front so basically no fronting. You must also have that um, systems in place and resources in place to collect, consolidate and report on financial and progress uh, performance of, of both the project and also the beneficiaries and, and also even the other stakeholders which might be affected by the project. Uh, when when we say there's not only here in all the other areas which, which I've touched on, you will need to by demonstrating, it means then you will need to supply proof. It could be a, a pilot project that you have you have done. It could be the financials. It could be depending on which area that you you are um, you are addressing. Now, um, thank you very much. I wish you good luck as you prepare your applications. And uh, just with a word of advice, please start early to, to uh, submit your application so that we can assist you along the way. I now hand you over to my colleague Vuyo, who will take you through the indicators. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, uh, Lionel. Uh, am I audible? Yes. Thumbs up will do. Awesome. No echo, right? Thanks. Thanks, guys. Right. Um, good day once again, ladies and gentlemen. My name is uh, Vuyo Tegyana. I am the Manager for Monitoring and Evaluation at the Jobs Fund. I'll be briefly taking you through the Jobs Fund program indicators today. Um, 
We won't be going into too much detail in this session as the, the session today is really designed to be an introduction to the hunting round. We will, however, be going to a lot more detail on these at our upcoming training session. We highly urge you to join us for that session. If, however, you have any questions as I go through the indicators, you need not wait until the end of the segment. Um, you're welcome to post those questions on the chat and our team will respond to your questions um, as, as we go. Great, uh, again, like Xavier, I'm just going to switch off my, my camera. I just wanted everyone to see who's speaking to them at the moment. Great. Over the course of the Jobs Fund's implementation, we've come to realize the changing trends in the labor market and the employment landscape. Whilst the Jobs Fund continues to strive for longer term employment for participants, we are mindful that sustainable employment is increasingly taking on different forms. It is with this in mind that we have updated our job indicators in an effort to accommodate these trends. The Jobs Fund recognizes five job types. The first is permanent jobs. These are jobs whose contracts of employment are of course permanent, uh, and that means they don't have uh, any time limit to them. We also recognize fixed term jobs. These are jobs whose contracts of employment are fixed for a minimum of 12 months. These jobs have a defined and finite term of employment. We recognize short term jobs. Short term jobs um, have employment contracts that are fixed at less than 12 months. These also have uh, finite terms of employment. We recognize seasonal jobs whose employment arrangements are periodic. In other words, they occur during specific seasons or busy periods only. We then lastly also recognize informal sector jobs. These are jobs that are created within the informal economy, either as a business owner or as an employee. In respect of business owners, these uh, owners' income is baselined prior to the start of the intervention. In the course of implementing the project, the income of the business owner is tracked over a minimum of six months to ensure that the income is sustainable for the entrepreneur before being recognized as a job. Next slide, please. In total, the Jobs Fund has eight main program indicators. Some of these main indicators include sub indicators. Indicator one relates to the number of new permanent jobs created. These are new jobs that did not exist in the market before. They have been created as a result of the intervention. They are typically enterprise development jobs, and that is to say they are created as a consequence of a business being formed or on as a consequence of that business's growth. Indicator two speaks to the number of permanent placements facilitated beyond project partners. These are jobs that arise as a consequence of filling a vacant position. The position sits with an organization with whom you do not have a partnership to provide trained participants for their vacancies. So to give a quick example, you are an IT training provider. You have a contract to, to provide um, trained participants to IBM and Microsoft. But Cisco Systems picks up on the good work that you are doing and starts to 
take on some of your graduates onto their organization, but you don't have a partnership arrangement with Cisco Systems. So in that instance, the placements that would be made at Cisco Systems would be reported under Indicator 2, hence these being placements beyond project partners. Indicator 3 speaks to the number of permanent placements facilitated with project partners. These are jobs that arise again as a consequence of filling a vacant position. The position sits with an organization with whom you do have a partnership to provide trained participants. So in the example that we just spoke to, the partners that you would have as the IT training provider being IBM and Microsoft, um, and the placements that are made into those organizations would then be reported under indicator three, because these are with project partners. Within each of these three indicators, indicators one, two, and three, we make specific distinction around subtypes. With respect to indicator one, for example, we recognize that not all new jobs are full time in nature and are expected to last indefinitely. For this reason, we acknowledge that a packer at checkers may only be employed during the store's busy periods during the month, but not on a full time basis. Indicator 1.1 therefore recognizes and accommodates this scenario. Um, please go move back, um, Delia. Oh yeah, let's go back. Let's go back. Yeah, no, 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 uh, one more forward. Oh, you don't have that slide. OK, all right, not a problem, but let's just stick to to this slide for now, please, Dila, because these are the sub indicators I'm speaking to. OK, thank you. All right, so just to recap then, um, in terms of indicator one, once again, right? Um, we've got indicator one, which speaks to new permanent jobs that are created, but we also have indicator 1.1 and 1.2. So I was just explaining um, at one, at the indicator 1.1 for now, and I was saying that where you have a situation where a packer at checkers is employed um, during busy periods um, for, the, for the retailer um, in the month, so maybe the first of the month or the middle of the month and so forth, right? that indicator 1.1 recognizes and accommodates that scenario. I'm now going to be speaking to a scenario where that is um, accommodated under indicator 1.2. So a printing business may want to take on frontline staff on a full-time basis, but not on a permanent basis as they are worried about the financial health of their business and would not want to overextend themselves by taking on staff permanently. This scenario is then accommodated by indicator 1.2. These principles as stated for indicator one around the full-time nature of a job and the extent of its permanency are the same for the sub indicators for indicators two and three. Indicator four relates to the number of short term jobs that are full time in nature, but are less than 12 months in duration. Indicator five deals with the measurement of completed internships that work seekers go through often after a training intervention. 
you will of course notice that the indicator is not measuring enrollments for internships, but successful completion. This therefore means that in targeting for this indicator, applicants will have to factor in attrition of participants. So in other words, um, the fallout rate from enrollment through to uh, successful completion of an internship. You need to factor that in when you are targeting for the successful completion of participants in this indicator. Indicator six measures the number of participants who have successfully completed market related training. This may be accredited or non-accredited training. Again, with this indicator, applicants need to factor in attrition as the indicator measures outcomes of successful completion of the training. Indicator seven measures an entrepreneur job created in the informal economy. Indicator eight measures an informal job created for a work seeker in the informal economy. Ladies and gentlemen, in closing, therefore, I would like to highlight the following. These program indicators are the main indicators that you'll be asked to target for in the application form. We do also ask you to complete what we call project specific indicators that relate specifically to your project and would help us track your path to success as you implement. Not all these indicators will relate to your project. This is really important for people to understand. It is, however, important that your project contains at least one of the job indicators as part of your application if you want to be competitive. These job indicators are indicators one, two, three, seven, and eight. All jobs must meet minimum wage requirements. We're a government program and we need to ensure that our interventions comply with the law. As part of your application process, you will be asked to nominate means of verification or evidence that you will submit to the jobs fund should you be successful on a quarterly basis, proving the realization of your indicator targets. Examples of acceptable evidence can be found in the term sheets for the 11th funding round under the indicator protocol reference sheet, which is Annex just seven. We accept that this may be a lot to take in, especially at this stage of the application process. So we expect that there will be more questions that you will have once you are you've started getting going with your application. Please jot down your questions as you complete the application and bring them along at our upcoming training session. Ladies and gentlemen, I would now like to invite my colleague Helena uh, to take us through the next segment of our of our session. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. My name is Elena. I will take you through the contracting. It's going to be short and brief as we indicated that we will have a training session on the 13th of June. We will go into more detail. Um, I'm also going to switch off my camera for bandwidth, but please post your questions in the chat and the team will respond. Thank you. So there are standardized grant agreements with general clauses that are available on our website. You must just note that the project specific conditions will be adjusted in line with the project specific conditions. But what is very important that there's a due diligence checklist on the website. Please respond to all the questions on the checklist and provide all the required information whether that is documentation or inputs, please, it's very important for us to conduct a due diligence on your organizations. Once we've gone through the appraisal process, um, our investment committee is the independent decision making body of the jobs fund, and we will inform you whether your application has been successful or unsuccessful. 
then the team will draft a grant agreement and then the activity based cost project implementation monitoring plan that we refer to as the ABC PIMP will also be finalized and then that will be shared with your organization for inputs, for comments, and then we will also have contracting meetings. We will discuss it. Please be mindful that the timelines are very stringent and the turnaround times are very short and it may also clash with the festive season, so please bear with us. We will also then amend the agreement. Then also remember there's going to be conditions precedent for signing that we require evidence that must be met and there's annexes 1 to 10 of the grant agreement that must be signed and sent to us. Once that has been finalized, we will update the grant agreement. The ABC PIMP will be updated and the annexes will be checked and then we'll submit it to our Deputy Director General for approval. And once it's been approved, we will send it to you for execution. So it's very important that you take note that it's intensive times during the contracting. There's a lot of things that we expect from you. Please bear with us and we wish you all the best with your application. I now hand you over to my colleague Alden that will take you through the online application. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Eliana. Um, and good morning to everyone that's on the call. Please keep the comments um, coming through and your questions. We're trying to answer it as quickly and as efficiently as possible. Um, we do also just to maybe say that the slide deck and the recordings will be available on our website. I see quite a number of the queries coming up with that. Um, and the next session, and I'm going to switch my camera off now. Uh, the next section here is really about how do we bring all of these different pieces of your application together? We opened on the 29th of May and we will be closing on the 17th of July. And we have our application um, being completed on our grant management system. So the URL is at the bottom of the screen again. It's been flashed into the chat. Um, so if you haven't had the opportunity um, to actually register on our system, we'll go through the next couple of slides that will give you a brief understanding as to how do we, we access the application. What's important to note is that all applications must be done and submitted online. We will not be accepting any handwritten applications or anything that's been emailed to us. It has to be done via the system. Um, we also went through the process around eligibility. If you are ineligible, you would be, um, you will receive a correspondence via the system. Um, and if you are able to successfully submit your application after passing the eligibility process, um, you will then go on to a, a, an assessment, um, the assessment stage. So like I said, the URL is being flashed into the chat from time to time, so we can move to the next slide. The easiest way to access our online application or the grant management system um, is if you go onto our website, www.jobsfund.org.za, and you would then follow the links. Um, there's a particular area that talks about apply to the fund to, to be on the left hand side of the Jobs Fund um, menu or website. Um, click on current calls for proposals, and you'll see that at that point, um, you'll have a bit of a further explanation. We then also have our brochure, our frequently asked questions can be accessed there, as well as the application user guide, which is a good idea to download this documentation because it gives you more insights into the process and what's expected of you um, when completing the application um, form via our system. There is an apply button and when you click that, it will then take you to or redirect you to our application um, or grant management site. So we can just move to the next slide. So what we have on the left hand side, when you click on that apply button, it will let you will access the, the landing page. And at this stage, if you have 
previously applied to the job. So you don't have to recreate a new login. You would still be able to use the same credentials. Um, the only item that you would need to do is to change your password, and there is a forgot password process um, that's available. If not, you would then click on the hyperlink that says uh, register now, where you would fill in a few pertinent details before you gain access to the system. Your login details will then be sent via an email. Once you've actually accessed the, the application form itself or the, the system, you will have the ability to create and register your application for the 11th funding round, um, where you would complete again pertinent information such as your project name, your institution, the business type, which funding window you are applying under. And once you've completed this process, you will have a unique jobs fund reference number that will be generated. This number is important because if you have any queries, you need to provide that reference number so that we are able to access your particular profile or your, your application that you have registered and give you the, the support that you require. The first page that you would see when you complete this registration process is the eligibility criteria. Xavier had gone through that particular process. Um, and once you pass the eligibility criteria page um, or tab, you would then be able to see the rest of the application form. So it's very important to read through the term sheet, understand if you have any questions, we will um, just flash the contact details. Um, but it's important that we understand that process before we start the eligibility criteria process um, on the system. If we can move to the next tab, Delia. So there are a couple of tips. Again, I encourage you to download the user guide via our jobs on website. It is available on the grant management system as well. There are eight sections. I think that the DDG did speak in the opening that it is quite a lengthy process. Um, and, you know, to ensure that we keep you focused, we've actually added a a, a um, timer or countdown clock, um, which you will see as soon as you enter the landing page. Um, time does run out fast, but the idea is that when you access the system, um, download the user guide, you can actually set and start preparing for what you would then put into those various fields um, that are required. Um, after the session, we will be uh, putting up or uploading a blank application form. Again, important to note that it's just to be used for planning purposes as everything needs to be submitted via the system. Um, there are a couple of key things in terms of the narrative sections as well, where you might have prepared a business case or some sort of research already that's been completed. We do allow for, or the system does allow for you to copy that information and then post it into the relevant text boxes. Um, we do have a session timeout, but it refreshes every time you click the save button. Very important to note um, is the second last bullet point there where you need to ensure that your pop-ups for this particular grant uh, management site of the jobs fund is enabled. Um, because the system does work with a pop-up messaging system. And if you don't enable it, you won't see the various uh, messages that will be um, uh, triggered as you continue the application process. Again, I think Alina touched on the point, no exceptions will be made um, in terms of the submission. Everything has to be submitted by the 17th of July, by three o'clock. Again, taking into account the time that it's going to take from now up until that point. Um, obviously, SCOM and load heating plays a part as well. Um, so the window is or the funding round is open so that you can plan out your application process to ensure that you submit your application through to us timelessly um, and hopefully before the 17th of July. Um, that in a nutshell is the online application process. Um, 
I think that for the next part, it's just really about the next steps, right? Um, if we can move to the next slide. So I think a question has also been um, asked in the chat quite frequently is when is this virtual training session taking place that everybody's referring to? Uh, it's on the 13th of June. I think the links have been sent out. I'm sure that CNET will also post it into the chat as well. So if you haven't had the chance to register just yet, um, you would then be able to do so. But this is really an in-depth um, assistance around the application process, the qualifying um, criteria and the funding requirements where we can ask those more sort of detailed questions. Um, the training session will cover our activity-based costing project implementation monitoring plan, quite a tongue twister, ABC pump for short, which is also a critical component for our application um, submission. The grant management system, the brief overview that I've just done now, will go in depth into what are the requirements for each of those various sections of the online application form. Um, grant agreement standard clauses, contracting process and due diligence. This will be done in a more in-depth level. Um, and then also what other post-training support is offered by the job. So we'll explain that further in the next training, um, in the next session, um, which is the 13th of June. So for the next part is really about our contact details. So again, if you have any specific inquiries, um, our website does have our email address, but it's on being displayed in the on the on the screen now at the moment. The jobs on at treasury.gov.za. Um, we also have further information on our website as well as on our grant management site. And then please um, be sure to have a look out on our social media accounts, our YouTube account as well as our Twitter account. We'll be posting. Um, um, some updates um, on those particular platforms. So anyways, that's it from me. Good luck, everybody. Hope to see you at the training session. I'm now going to hand back to the DDG for her closing remarks. Thank you. Hi. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you very much to, for, to the participants in this morning session. Brilliant questions and um, you've kept us on our toes and I do hope that my team and I have been able to respond to all of you, um, but we are going to work through the questions and if there are any questions that remain unanswered, we will update the frequently asked uh, questions and we will repost that onto our website. Um, the presentation will be on the website. Um, you know, there's going to be a mock application form. Um, there will be um, operating uh, guidelines. Many of you have asked about, you know, our reporting requirements and reporting formats. Um, just to say that, you know, if you are successful in this funding round, um, we would make an assessment after you've you know, completed your project implementation plan. We will make an assessment as to what your first kind of drawdown will be. What is the first disbursement? <coughs> and then after that, every quarter, you would submit a quarterly report online and there's a template for that. Um, there's quite a few templates that we have in the jobs fund. Um, there's a template for you to complete your your your, your quarterly report. Um, there is uh, uh, information about the type of evidence that you that you must submit for the jobs that you've, you've that you've created for the for the money that has has been spent. If you hit your targets and you reach the 80% of the targets for that quarter, then we make the next drawdown, and that depends on, of course, whether your matched funding is sitting um, in your ring bank account. Um, people have also asked about, so how long does all of this take? Well, this is a competitive process. We don't operate as a, as other DFIs would, where, you know, when you receive an application, they will attend to it, they will go through their processes and then come back. We close, there's a very hard close on the 17th um, of July, and um, then immediately there is a, a, a um, a, a, an assessment of you know uh, project status with regard to eligibility and within a few days you're advised whether you're eligible 
What does it mean? If you are eligible, you are in the race. We now take all the information that you have provided us and we start doing our in-depth appraisal of your application. We conduct an extensive uh, due diligence. And that is also why, you know, you know, one of the key factors that drives time is the fact that Sometimes applicants don't upload all the documents that we require. So there's a back and forth asking people to submit um, the, the, the documentation so we can do our appraisals. In that process, the first thing that we do, right, is we go, we have a technical committee and um, my team does the initial appraisal of the applications. It goes to a technical committee. They have a take a view on it. It then goes to our investment committee. And that is, you know, once it goes to the investment committee, the first decision they make is whether this application resonates and whether there is alignment with the with the criteria that we have set for the funding round. Um, that kind that those those sessions have already been scheduled in our investment committee and technical committee um, diaries. The investment committee, um, who is the only committee that makes um, allocation decisions around grants, they're already scheduled to sit in October. From that process if you have been deemed competitive sufficiently competitive we will advise you that we are now going into another level of detail in terms of your application the next um, a, a set of meetings for the investment committee is then scheduled in February and March, and that is when they make the decision to fund. So it sounds like a really long process, but as I said, the number of applications, the quality of the applications, the quality of the information that is uploaded, all of that are key drivers um, to 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 the timeframes. So I encourage people when you when you apply please look carefully at what um what uh, documentation we require from you because that also then helps us to speed up um the process so um my team has also invited you to a more detailed and in-depth training session next week tuesday the 13th of june i hope you can make it it's going to be a little bit longer than this morning's i see that we have saved you uh, around about 40 minutes to to do um important things that you all do um and just to, I'm just looking at the chat. I don't see that there's any kind of last minute questions that we haven't answered. So once again, let me say thank you very much to all of you for making yourselves available, for posting the questions. Um, you know, it's very important, you know, in, in how we respond to those questions because then we share the learning. We really do look forward to quality um, applications from, from all of you here. So with that, I wish you a really good day further. Thank you very much, everybody. Bye-bye now.